Uh, all right. Um, so my name is Andrew Heron. I'm a staff scientist at uh, Argonne National Lab. This is a um, this is the Department of Energy, uh, U.S. National Lab. It's about half an hour from uh, from here. Uh, so I'm I'm a cosmologist. Um, uh, I'm a theorist. Uh, I, I work on numerical computational approaches to to understanding dark matter and dark energy. And most of what I'd like to talk about are just to give you a feeling for different ways in which modern cosmology uses uh, simulations of the universe in order to understand uh, dark matter and dark energy, the, the energy contents of the universe and its history. So, um, broad outline, I'll sort of get us warmed up, uh, giving a sort of broad brush picture of, of, of actually starting off with astronomy. Uh, so just a uh, basic picture of the sort of scales that are involved and trying to give some motivation for the enormously computationally expensive simulations that are run in order to try to improve our understanding of, of cosmology. Um, and particularly the, the sort of main application that I want to talk about for uh, of, of, of simulations is how we, can, how we can use simulations to do inference, to actually learn about the real values of, of, of parameters describing the evolutionary history, things like, like, like dark energy. And if I have time, um, towards the end I'll talk about sort of qualitatively different ways that we use uh, simulations to uh, to build scientific understanding of, uh, of cosmology. So I'll do my best to not take us too far um, in the weeds and focus on uh, sort of qualitatively different approaches and um, different characters of, of inference and uses of simulations. And people should absolutely feel free to stop me at, uh, at any point. I have no desire to get through a pre-programmed amount of material. So take me a face value on that. Um, okay, so uh, in a nutshell, the story of our cosmic history goes like this. Um, uh, in the beginning, there, uh, <laughs> the universe uh, uh, was infinitely hot and dense and was expanding. Uh, and uh, after a period of inflation, uh, about which I will say very little, um, the universe was, a, was a, a hot plasma that was expanding and cooling until, um, until the time of it's called uh, recombination, when the hot photons that were previously locked up by their frequent interactions with, with, this, this, with this plasma began to free stream um, and uh, basically stream through a then neutral universe until the, those photons arrived at our telescope today as the cosmic microwave background. During that time, for a, for a while, basically nothing interesting happened. This is what's labeled as the Dark Ages. So there was no galaxies or no stars. There was a largely homogeneous bath of, of very little physics to discuss of interest. And then very slowly and gradually, these tiny little initial seeds of over and under dense patches um, collapsed uh, under their own weight and formed the stars and galaxies that we now see. Uh, at late times, um, a mysterious phenomenon uh, in which the this expanding universe began to increase its rate of expansion, um, known as dark energy, uh, became operative. And that'll be the main, that, that era will be the sort of main focus of, of, of my, my interest in applications of simulations. So before we get to that, just a brief comment on the relative scales that are, that are involved uh, in, in studying cosmology. So here's a quick schematic of the rough size of, the, of our solar system. Um, going towards slightly larger scales to the next nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is uh, a few light years away, uh, roughly a parsec is a, is a few light years. This is the characteristic distance between stars in the galaxy. Slightly, uh, the next natural scale in the problem is not the distance between stars, but the rough, the rough size of a galaxy itself. So our Milky Way galaxy is roughly 100,000 light years across uh, and contains a few hundred billion stars. Uh, and maybe I'll just also point out um, that uh, roughly all objects that you can see with the naked eye um, at, at night, even in the most pristine of uh, conditions, are all inside the Milky Way. So anything you can see with the naked eye is essentially cosmological distance zero. Um, so our next nearest galaxy uh, is, uh, our next nearest galaxy of comparable size is Andromeda. Uh, which is of order millions of light years away. Uh, Andromeda is also essentially a cosmological distance to zero. 
Uh, the next, the sort of next natural scale in the problem is not distance between the nearest galaxy, but the distance to the nearest cluster of galaxies. So galaxies are composed of galaxies are gravitationally self-bound systems with stars orbiting around inside a common potential. Uh, the same is also true of galaxies, at least those that live in galaxy clusters, the nearest one of which is Virgo. Uh, so these are galaxies orbiting around each other in a common potential. Uh, they contain of order 1 to 10 trillion stars. Uh, let's see. The characteristic distance scale here is of order, um, now we're on scales of megaparsecs, so actually a cluster is of order, ten, of order a megaparsec away, and the characteristic distance between clusters is about 10 megaparsecs. So we observe these um, objects that I was just describing with sort of two kinds of telescopes, one of which, um, some of which orbit in, uh, above the atmosphere, like the Hubble Space Telescope, others which are on the ground and have to look at galaxies through the atmosphere. So let's see, this is an image of the Hubble Space Telescope during a servicing mission. Uh, so and now I'll just shamelessly show you a few beautiful images of galaxies as observed by Hubble. Uh, so uh, this is an image of the Southern Pinwheel. Uh, here's a gorgeous uh, image of the Sombrero Galaxy. Um, here's an image uh, from HST of a pair of interacting galaxies, which are experiencing a, a, a merger event. Uh, so I love showing these images because I used to be, um, in, a, in a previous life not that long ago, I used to be a mathematician. So I, uh, when, I was a, when I was a PhD student in math, I found that the, this is the very best way to get someone to just look right through me and that is at a party and as soon as I would would stop talking they would make some excuse like they want to go to the bathroom or get another drink. All I would have to do to trigger that behavior was just to tell them that I was a PhD in math. Uh, and so I had to just develop this whole conversational technique of like reeling people back in like no I have, I have other interests that we, we could talk about instead. But in, uh, in astronomy it's very, it's very straightforward. I mean mo most people have seen beautiful images like this from HST and they would they love to talk about them. Uh, and, uh, in fact, um, this is also a common conversational trick amongst um, <laughs> astronomers, astrophysicists, cosmologists, uh, so on, on airplanes especially. Um, so when cosmologists get together at conferences, one of the most common experiences is just how much we, how much we travel, and so we talk about various details about our air, our air travel. And then I found that, um, that, uh, it, that there's the convergent evolution in, in, the, in the behavior of whether or not you're in a mood to talk to someone who you're seated next to. Um, well, you will, you'll either say, if, if you are, you'll say that you're an astronomer. And if you're not, then you'll say that you're an astrophysicist. Uh, and <laughs> most people just immediately shut down their, their auditory response and they want to go back to whatever it is they were doing before you said that. So anyway, I'm shamelessly showing you some pretty images um, <laughs> to get the talk started. Um, so this is an image not of an individual galaxy, but of a a field of galaxies, which without, uh, if you were to look at with your naked eye or even with any telescope that's not um, looking through the atmosphere, would look like a completely black spot, and yet is full of this gorgeous structure of this incredible diversity of galaxies. And um, my, uh, my favorite way to capture how, how the, kind of, the kind of picture that Hubble gives you of, of our cosmology is to show what this field of view looks like next to the moon. So you can see right here, this XDF, this little square, is just a, it's just a patch of black nothing, but it contains all of this enormous world of galaxies that, uh, that Hubble reveals that are completely obscure when you look at it through, through the atmosphere. So, uh, so the second class of telescopes that we use in order to study cosmology are ground-based uh, imaging telescopes. Like this is an example of the Sloan Digital Sky uh, Survey. So rather than um, looking at small patches like the extreme deep field, uh, Slow Digital Sky Survey actually observes 10,000 square degrees of, uh, of the sky, and so it was able to make really fantastic maps of all of the galaxies uh, in the universe within that extremely large uh, open angle. Um, so, so a bit of a bit of cosmology jargon. When I say um, when I say large scale structure, I mean something reasonably specific. I mean the statistical distribution of galaxies as quantified by images like this. So by, by imaging telescopes that have very large fields of view um, and observe galaxies in the billions. So okay, um, one of the basic facts about our cosmology is that the universe is expanding. So just let me 
brief and talk about how we how we know that, why we have confidence in that information. Um, so the way that we observe the distance of galaxies is through their is through their gravitational redshift. So this is like the this is like the the relativistic version of the Doppler effect. So if you observe a galaxy and you have some be able to be able to observe the spectrum of a of a galaxy, by which I just mean you take the light from a galaxy and you fan it out through a prism, and you're able to identify some very special feature in that galaxy, some spectral line, like a like a like a doublet in the uh, in the in the emission of the galaxy, and you're able to compare where you know from uh, from some other means where that what wavelength you would observe that that feature in the spectrum to where you actually observe it through this through this prism that you put on the galaxy. That difference in wavelength can be translated directly into the distance of the galaxy, um, because the galaxy, as I'll uh, as I'll describe in just a second, is is receding away from you in a, in a at a rate that's proportional to its distance. So, here's a specific example, rather than a cartoon, of the of the absorption or the the, the, the spectra from our sun. So you have these very characteristic lines that you see in the spectrum of our sun, um, and just by comparing the wavelength at which you observe, for example, these two followed by a third very close uh, features in the spectrum uh, to where we actually observe uh, in, for example, a galaxy which is just composed of many, 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 many suns, then you can get a picture of the, the recession velocity of a galaxy. So the basic fact that we observe by measuring redshifts of galaxies is that they're all racing away from us. Okay, so this is the, re the, the, the recession velocities and the, the redshifts of galaxies is one of the basic pieces of evidence that we have that our, our universe is expanding. Um, and as I said, the, the recession velocity of galaxies is in proportion to their distance uh, from us. So this is a fact that's been known for, for nearly 100 years. Uh, and this, uh, the reason why that's a compelling piece of evidence that our universe is expanding is because it's a completely generic uh, feature of, an ex of a space which is itself expanding. Right? So as we look in any given direction, um, whether it's up or down or left or right, we always see that on average statistically galaxies are racing away from us. So either we're at some special point in the universe or space itself is expanding. So every point is expanding, is racing away from every other point. So this has a very nice and natural um, quantitative description in the context of general relativity. So there are very few uh, known closed form solutions to the Einstein field equations, but one of them is a homogeneous distribution of mass, which is either expanding or contracting. So that particular solution is known as the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker uh, solution to the Einstein field equations. So uh, there's no, so in this picture of an expanding space, there's not any central point, there's no special point. Space is completely homogeneous and isotropic. It's space itself that expands. So if we wind back the clock then, so if we, we observe galaxies receding away from us uh, in this very regular way, it's consistent with um, the FRW metric, then if you wind back the clock in the opposite direction, then all of, all of matter and energy at some previous time, it turns out about, about, about 14 billion years ago, must have been in a very hot, dense state. So uh, homogeneous distributions of, of mass in, in a hot uh, thermal state uh, exhibit black body spectra, uh, and in fact, we observe this with microwave telescopes. Um, in, a, in a set of observations, we, we go under the umbrella term of the cosmic microwave background. And for example, this is a this is a figure taken from uh, uh, as imaged by the, uh, the, the the COBE satellite. So this is uh, turns out the essentially the most perfect black body that has ever been measured. Um, uh, especially relative to a laboratory, uh, anything that can be accomplished in a, in a laboratory. So this alone, I think, was, was gave, I think, very strong quantitative evidence of this general picture of an expanding uh, universe. And this is what the, rather than just the spectral distribution, but actually what the spatial uh, distribution of this, this cosmic microwave background looks like. So this is an image, this is a map taken from the Planck, uh, the, recent, the recently completed Planck satellite. So not only do we observe that that the cosmic microwave background has a essentially perfect black body spectrum, but it's also almost perfectly spatially homogeneous, so roughly to one part in 10 to the 5. There's no differences in the energy density in any direction that you look. 
but it's not a perfect, um, it's not a perfect homogeneous path of, of matter and energy. So these, there are one part in ten to the five differences. So the the the, the spatial variations on that uh, on on that scale uh, contain actually lots of information about the energy contents of the universe. So I think the way to think about this map is that it's giving you a picture of of, of the homogene of the roughly homogeneous distribution of matter and energy um, that were in thermal equilibrium and were essentially oscillating like a coherent fluid. So you have um, you have some regions which are overdense and some regions which are underdense, and uh, because this this material was in was in thermodynamic equilibrium, then you have characteristic harmonic oscillation, which leaves this nice oscillatory pattern in the in the power spectrum of, uh, of, of the distribution of mass uh, in the early universe. So the power spectrum is just the Fourier transform of the correlation function. So let me briefly describe just quantitatively what a correlation function is. So uh, it describes the excess number of pairs of points in excess of random <laughs> as a function of their spatial distance from one another. So in other words, you have some distribution of points in the universe and you just go and count the number of pairs of points that are separated by some distance. Okay. That tells you the correlation function on that scale. So it's unity when, when the points are randomly distributed and excess of unity when they're not. And then when you take the Fourier transform of that, you get the power spectrum. So that's roughly what's being plotted here in this figure. Um, and the, the, the red points with the error bars in this figure are measurements from the, uh, from the Planck satellite. Um, and then the blue curve, which is going through these points, is a six parameter model describing this rich oscillatory structure. Uh, so this is the this is the, the cosmic microwave background power spectrum, uh, and this rich structure with 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 relative peak heights and uh, that, that that change as a function of scale um, and widths, with also, which also change as a function of their peak height. All of these all of these rich features are captured by just six parameters, uh, and those six parameters are the parameters which are the solution to the Einstein equations, which are the parameters of the FRW metric. So um, this is a story that most of you know, and most of you probably also recognize in the form of a pie chart, um, which is a, a apparently obligatory way of describing the contents of the universe, because we don't really know what dark energy or dark matter uh, are, and so they're best represented in the form of a, of a pie chart. <laughs> uh, so, so this is this is actually now a relatively complete story as told by the Planck satellite. So we have. We have excellent statistical constraints on these energy contents of the universe, and it includes the vast majority of, of this matter is unlike anything that has been observed in a, la in a laboratory uh, tabletop experiment before or in an accelerator. So, great. So, the Planck satellite, uh, as of last week, is now um, has now had its official sort of final um, final in terms of the collaboration, writing collaborative papers together, and putting their Putting their stamp on it, analysis, um, and so that's uh, that's more or less the, the, the beginning and the end of the story that we will learn about dark energy from CMB experiments like the ones that I was like the ones that I was describing. Uh, and of course, it's very unsatisfying because these experiments will not tell us, for example, what dark energy is, and will not actually give us much more information on dark energy at all than it has already been given. And the reason is that dark energy really only becomes Operative at at low redshift. So over the past few billion years, dark energy is, is it's in this relatively recent epoch where dark energy begins to become a significant contribution to the energy contents of the universe. But the CMB is giving us information about our cosmology after about a few hundred thousand years, and so that's uh, that's more or less the story as to why we cannot learn a lot more just from this sort of classic CMB measurements about but what dark energy is. Uh, so, 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 so now what do we do? Well, we need some way to probe cosmology using some more recent history where dark energy's physics is, is operative. And so that's that's where large scale structure uh, comes in. So the the universe of galaxies that we observe, for example, like I've been showing with images of the Sloan Digital Interstate from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, are giving you a picture of of the universe of galaxies at more recent times when dark energy has been operative and has, has been having a strong impact on both. The expansion history of the universe, but also on the growth of structure and how rapidly galaxies form. So this is the main, I think, this is the main focus of, of this talk is how we can actually learn 
about dark energy and dark matter um, with measurements of large scale structure. Uh, in particular, how we can how we can do inference about about this energy contents using sort of simulation based interpretations of our observations from telescopes. So before I move on to a section second section of the talk is uh, is that was that clear enough for the sort of broad brush strokes of the universe? Okay, great. Okay. So, so, so as a theorist, so this is this is in a nutshell the, the I think the basic goal of this program of large scale structure cosmology. So we know with high precision the energy contents of the universe uh, at roughly a redshift 1100, and the goal is to be able to predict the redshift distribution of, uh, the distribution of galaxies that we see today. Um, let me see. So. I'll skip over this. This is more or less just a statement that, that uh, large-scale structure observations give very complementary information to cosmology than we see in the CMP. Uh, so this is this is uh, big business for for science. So an example of uh, of that is actually from a meeting that I uh, have been at this week uh, until today. Um, the, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope (LSST) um, is is a sort of next generation uh, ground-based imaging telescope that's on top of a mountain in Chile. This is an artist's uh, rendering of what the telescope will look like when it's been complete. Uh, so these are very large collaborations of, of, I think maybe the figure now is we have maybe seven or eight, I think it's not quite 800 members of scientists that are sort of working on, working on science directly related to this, with this telescope. Um, and See. Oh, uh, so I learned this amazing thing uh, at, this, at this meeting recently. So I'm a theorist, and I don't know that much about cameras and telescopes, and or at least I've you know have on the job training with that. Um, so the, the 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 camera that was been that's been built for LSST um, is a uh, so it'll be the largest camera by far that has ever been constructed by human beings. Uh, so it is the not quite the size of this room, but significantly larger than a large SUV. <laughs> it's a digital camera that just gets stuck on the back of this enormous. Uh, telescope, um, and it collects just an incredible amount of data every every single night. So roughly, so, so uh, roughly ten terabytes of data every single night, and it will be observing the entire uh, the entire sky as visible from Chile um, every three nights, and it'll be in, op in operations for ten years time. Uh, act, uh, I'd love to talk more about the design of this telescope. It has this uh, this incredibly clever um, observing strategy where you take twin exposures in back-to-back 15-second -back patterns, so you can observe for any given point that you're observing. If it if it has intrinsic variation on that time scale, you capture it. But you also capture it because it's because the, the sky is observed every every three days. Then if there's observing, then if there's variations in, in any given object, galaxies or stars or, or supernovae, um, then you capture it on three-day time scales, uh, and then you have this time baseline over a, over a decade's time. So this is completely unique. Uh, to LSST, at least this long baseline, this repeated observing strategy. So, anyway, it's, uh, it's a it will be a beautiful instrument, and we'll learn we'll learn an incredible amount about the sky, completely independent of dark matter and dark energy. So, um, this is an, on, an ongoing survey. This is an image from the dark uh, dark energy survey collaboration. This is a DES. So, this is um, this is a uh, a major, I think, cosmological survey in its own right. That's in some ways a precursor to LSST, but is also uncovering new things that we're learning about cosmology um, as we speak. So this image you might recognize is actually taken right here at uh, East Chicago, even just a few blocks away. Um, so, okay, so what is the basic task for being able to make predictions that we can then compare to our observations that we take with these, these gigantic telescopes? So, well, we need to be able to solve for the evolution of the energy contents of, uh, of the universe. Um, so the, the, the relevant equations uh, for, for if you have a homogeneous distribution of mass which has over and under densities that collapse under their own weight are the Vlasov-Poisson equations which describe the phase space evolution of over and under densities um, in, in an FRW uh, background. Um, so these are, right, so Vlasov-Poisson equations govern the evolution from the, this sort of early, sort of early, this early, early time from the from the sort of period of CMB to the to the present day, um, these are highly nonlinear equations um, with uh, with no useful symmetries in sight. So there's this is completely unlike any kind of pencil and paper work that you can do to solve differential equations um, that have sort of known closed form uh, solutions. So there's a couple of features 
of, that I think are interesting to sort of pause over before I, uh, before I move on, um, because so um, if there's no known if there's no known sort of test case that we can that we can compare our, our solutions to these differential equations for, <coughs> as I hope will become clearer and clearer as the talk goes on, this this is a very serious obstacle towards how, how confident we can be in the character of the, of the knowledge that we have about cosmology. So for what I'm going to describe are methods to numerically solve this very complicated uh, system of differential equations. And unlike, uh, unlike for example, zero finding, where you can, you can develop an algorithm for finding the zero of some nonlinear function, where you can test how your algorithm performs in some sort of special cases, there is nothing like that of any kind for, for predicting the distribution of structure in cosmology. So there's, there are special cases like the way that gravitational collapse proceeds when you have some, some sphere of mass and some otherwise perfectly homogeneous bath of matter and energy distributed throughout uh, the universe. And that, as you can see from this image, is just nothing at all like what we, like what we see in, in structure formation. Uh, so it's very difficult to actually validate any methods of solutions to these equations when there's no known answer that you can compare to. So one thing you might uh, then try to do is to validate your methodology by running your numerical uh, methods at sort of one scale of resolution, one scale of numerical precision, and then another one, and, and then see whether or not your answer has converged. So that sounds like a sort of quotidian detail that's just best done by scientists working in, uh, uh, in the dark and, and late hours and not sort of spending any time talking about it. But I can assure you it's not, at all, um, it's not at all trivial because it's not just a matter of whether or not your answer has converged. It's not clear what that would even, what that would even mean. Because as you, as you try and solve the equations of motion for the Vlasov, uh, for the Vlasov Hassan equation, at smaller and smaller scales, you're actually resolving different physical processes. So on very, very large scales, for example, the collapse of giant molecular clouds that, uh, that form stars just has nothing at all to do with the distribution of, of galaxies um, relative to each other. So in other words, you don't need to resolve the physics uh, of, the, of the collapse of gas clouds in order to understand how galaxies orbit around each other. There's, there's an entirely negligible impact of that. But if you actually care about resolving the structure of a galaxy, then you very much do uh, need to at least understand how the giant electric clouds are distributed. Uh, and yet, um, you know, so, so, then, so then how do you even proceed? So you can try and test whether or not your methods of solution have converged by running a higher resolution version of your, of your calculation, but then what? It's not even the same calculation anymore. So when you, when you try and test your methods of solution with a, a, a higher resolution, you're not even actually describing the same system. Yeah, so. Good question. So what's analytically known about this uh, equation? Um, From the point of view? Uh, uh, very little. Um, yeah, if, uh, so that, Are there any stability results, for instance, even you know, small, small growth stability? There, so there are, there are many test cases, for example, over how, how a system should evolve under, under uh, for example, a, a, uh, axial symmetry and yes. at what rate instabilities should should evolve and grow um, you know as as you essentially create a wind tunnel uh, type, uh, type simulation or as you drop a point tracer th uh, through that but again um, so, uh, uh, so for axial symmetry, I should there say is, there are stability results. there are, uh, there, are stability, yeah. there are stability results and they are useful still for for checking that your code is correct under those assumptions right so and they're, and they're used ubiquitously and, and that's actually, those test cases are test cases that, that people who develop these codes to be able to operate under, under the scales involved do use to, to compare results to each other. But then, then they apply the same code to an entirely different system, and sometimes they agree and sometimes they don't, and no one knows what the correct answer is. So there's, there's a long history, I think, of, of Scientists making fools of themselves by saying that there will not be progress on a, on, on a given problem. Uh, I would like to absolutely join the ranks of those fools <laughs> and, and say that there will never be an analytical solution to the Vlasov-Poisson equations that's relevant for this distribution of structure. 
So, so yeah. how much would you think about this equation uh, applies to Navier-Stokes equation to meteorology? Is, so it, is it much more complicated than, no, than Navier-Stokes, or is it? Navier-Stokes is harder. Um, it's but the same. So it's kind of a. But I, I think we encounter the, the same features. Of what we, you're saying. We encounter the same uh, the same exact problems uh, with, with Lasa Poisson that we do in Navier-Stokes. Okay. So you can but, integrate uh, both techniques in some sense. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And there's many more resources already developed into meteorology. That's right. Meteorology, so. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but this equation, uh, is it used in general relativity or is it Newtonian? Actually, no. No. So this equation actually pertains, let me see. This equation actually pertains, so there's a formal decoupling that one makes, uh, that one assumes in order to arrive at this form of the equation, in which there is a, uh, so, uh, in which the, the gravitational potential that's operative, uh, the, or the, the gravitational potential in, in this equation um, is, is essentially the Poisson equation. And then the Poisson equation is solved against a, a homogeneous background that's, that's, that's approximated by the FRW metric. So there, there is, in fact, um, an entire separate set of questions about structure formation related to how much ignoring general relativistic effects in that approximation impact distribution of large-scale structure. Um, those are not, that's not our current, um, that's not a current, those approximations are not a current limiting factor in our ability to make accurate predictions that are relevant for, for cosmology, but it's certainly a non-zero, uh, a non-zero difference. So to figure out that, but the nabla x there is the, is, is the curve nabla? Yes, that's right. right of the background. Yes, that's right. Uh, well, mm, well, yeah, yes and no. So, so uh, only in so far as um, as x is the x includes so the expansion factor of, uh, of the universe. So, right, so that so the, the, the scale factor. Yes. The coordinate coordinates. Yes, that's right. And so formally, that's the way that, that the expansion is coupled uh, into the Poisson equation in, in this in this system. So. So the way that one proceeds in order to solve this differential equation is by discretizing this 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 uh, the, uh, by, by, dis by discretizing the continuous system. So in other words, you approximate the true smooth continuous phase space distribution with a set of point particles. So you replace it with a set of delta functions. But so you have a, the, the Hamiltonian is then replaced by uh, by the, the, the momentum and the, the the gravitational potential that these point particle approximations uh, feel and move with respect to each other. So now you have a discretization of this continuous system, and you solve it by incrementally stepping forward, time step by time step by time step, with essentially with billions or now trillions of different uh, particles that you whose, whose motion and force relative to each other uh, you solve for in this discrete in this discrete fashion. So let me show you what a, what, a, what a given solution to this discrete system looks like. Uh, well, I guess let me, let, me first, let me first show you how we solve it, uh, which is through just massive supercomputers. So this is one of the most computationally intensive problems in all of science. Um, and we use the, the, the world's largest supercomputers to do this incremental step by step by step of billions and trillions of particles. So here's a visualization. By uh, by Benedict Diemer, um, this is a, a simulation that he ran. Uh, he's a scientist at um, the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard, uh, and also this is a visualization of the density field of these of these tracer particles, uh, starting from the beginning of time and then proceeding through to 13. Point, let's see, nine giga years, uh, so maybe slightly past the present day. How sensitive is it to the initial conditions? It can be it can be very sensitive depending on when you begin the simulation. So if it's only actually been relatively recently appreciated that you need to start you need to begin this simulation at actually very early times, much earlier than initially thought. So uh, so redshift, for example, at, at at redshift 50 is already too late in order in order to predict make pre precision predictions for cosmology. Uh, you just roughly step back to to redshift 200 uh, in order to sort of accurately capture the distribution of large-scale structure today. And when you're setting up your initial condition with your point particles, how closely are you matching the statistics of the uh, uh, 
of the uh, power function on the on the on the correlation function of the particle. Uh, it's, I mean, so it's so the, so you start off with a, a homogeneous distribution of, of these point masses, and there's uh, a, a essentially a dedicated subfield towards accurately introducing the initial conditions as as the power spectrum that we see in the CMB, and it's important to to have have that be uh, sub tenth of percent accurate on all scales that you are actually going to try and resolve. So, it, but, but I, I, I guess I'm kind of confused because you're okay. saying that your initial conditions are have statistics that the power spectrum of the CMB does, but you also said you're introducing homogeneous set of the point particles. Right, so, sorry, um, operationally, mm -hmm. that was confusing because I was just describing the way that the algorithm uh, works, yeah, but, uh, so operationally you begin by, um, you begin with a, ho with a homogeneous distribution and then you perturb, okay. you perturb the particles in such a way that they give you the CMB power spectrum. So, uh, that's a way of just formally describing a universe that, that is the CMB, uh, as we see it at redshift at low at 100, and then beginning at that moment, then when you have some region of the universe which is which has more particles than others, well then it'll it'll begin to collapse. Um, and is, is the reason that you don't just start the simulation with the point particles distributed this way because then you can just assign then you would have to come up with assigned velocities. Yes, that's, yeah, correct. So let me see. So this is a large scale simulation. So this is roughly. Uh, this must be about 300 megaparsecs across, and here, and remember, remember it was about roughly 10 megaparsecs that was the characteristic scale between galaxy clusters, and here's one that's on smaller scales, so we can see only a few galaxy clusters at the end. Uh, so <coughs> smaller scales, uh, a smaller scale simulation means that you can resolve, you can resolve sort of, you can get higher resolution picture of, of the constituents of the universe. Uh, so here we'll end up with a sort of zoom-in picture of maybe a few galaxy clusters that are all along a few uh, filaments that feed the, the formation of the, of the clusters. And I think this makes it even, this sort of zoom-in makes the sort of filamentary structure of the cosmic web uh, maybe, maybe even clearer. So, so close order, how many particles are in the, the faintest strands that we see? And do those, cor do those correspond to galaxies? So the, uh, every, let's see. That's good. So these big knots, these big bright spots that are at the centers of filaments are galaxy clusters. And the galaxies that make up those clusters and also the galaxies that live in these filaments are, all, are more like these tiny knots. So they'd be like, here's a Milky Way, and here's a Milky Way, and here's a Milky Way, and here's a Milky Way. But for instance, like, so I see filaments without those dots in them. Is that just gas? There's no galaxies in there. Uh, that's right. Okay. That's right. I mean, well, there, there will be, there will either be galaxies or they will be too small to be resolved by this simulation. Maybe it's a, it's a more accurate answer. Do you, maybe it's more a philosophical question. It's very philosophical. Yes. It's like, when I look at it, it's interesting because it looks exactly the opposite of uh, when I was, if I looked at the movie of a gas of particle, like they would homogenize. So is there a way, with, with, so what I'm saying here is that when you look at this movie, it looks like a, uh, reverse, uh, uh, you know, the, the reverse track movie of uh, of how uh, inhomogeneous system uh, homogenizes itself. So, is there a way? The question is: Is there a way somehow to track out to define a sort of entropy and track out what are, what's happening with the second law there? Uh, because it looks like, you know, I'm going against the second law. Right. The second law tells me I should thermalize, and here you're telling me no, 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 you go the other way, which is obvious because it's an attractive force. And saying it's, it's but. Is there a thermodynamical understanding of this simulation that could help understand the Vlasov equation? So, this particular simulation that I uh, that I just showed you, I uh, was being a little dishonest because this is <coughs> this is actually a collisionless system. This is actually a gravity-only dark matter simulation. So, uh, so dark matter is uh, is is cold. It has essentially zero temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all these are all uh, non-relativistic particles. So, I'm actually not even showing. Um, I'm not showing a, a simulation that includes gas, uh, which, uh, which would be a thermal equilibrium uh, uh, with itself in any given patch. Um, well, so what I was I, doing is, is more at a, some kind of qualitative level, right? Mm -hmm. Usually you can tell, you know, when you have a movie whether Humpty Dumpty is break, you know, you break Humpty Dumpty, and uh -huh. if, I move, if I show the movie one way or the other, I can tell which is the arrow of time. Right. Th this type of movie looks exactly like the reverse arrow of time. Of, if I was looking at the homogenization process. Uh, anyway, so there's, 
do people worry about that? Is there? A, uh, uh, I think that might be an interesting philosophical question into these simulations. Would, would this be a way of putting the question? Is there like a natural measure of disorder and order that you, you define in these simulations? Um, not on large cosmological scales, I guess. That, uh, I don't think I have a good answer to that question. Well, why, why, why wouldn't the two-point correlation function be a natural measure? Of the entropy? Uh, of the orderedness of the system, right? Because in, in some, in some, uh, in a perfectly homogeneous system, you presumably wouldn't have a preferred scale that comes up in your correlation function, right? So it seems, it, it won't be a measure directly to entropy, but it at least seems to measure whether there's structure. That's, so that's definitely true. Yeah. Uh, and the, yeah. Maybe, and so the way of, the way of, of describing the non-intuitive nature of this is that the correlation function, which describes the excess of uh, the, the number of pairs in excess of random, does become you become you get stronger and stronger correlation functions as, as time evolves. So that's the non that's the counterintuitive way of at least quantifying what you're what you're describing. Uh, but mm -hmm. um, but it, it, I think, yeah, sorry. I think this question relates to uh, uh, and I think ephemerals. Yes, yes, uh, totally. To describe entropy to the gravitational field in a thermodynamic uh, picture of this situation. Because otherwise, it, yeah, it seems like it's, it's determining the second law. Yeah. So, Which yeah. Means, yeah. I would I would say technically when you know I took it as a challenge you cannot solve the vast of course of equation which is never really true but in some sense it means it, it begs for a like a notion of entropy that allow you to understand the, this equation so that I was wondering if people have tried because it, it's exactly because of the Penrose question somehow there, there seems to be something interesting or strange about uh, oh, the flow of information in such system it goes. I understand the question, but I okay. think I don't have a deep answer. Okay, for it. good. No, it's I just think a Ellie, uh, George Ellis uh, came up with the idea of, uh, well, what's the problem of the idea? If you get uh, an estimate of the entropy from the vial tensor, so mm -hmm. there are a few papers trying to get estimated of the entropy. That one that is interesting. Sure, you can raise your hand. It's a good question. Okay, so what can we actually do? How can we actually learn about about cosmology using these these simulations besides make besides make pretty movies? Yeah. Well, so I do have a question. Okay. Can we, but the, if you take the simulations that you show, if, if you did the same simulation, would you get would you set up the same initial conditions and would you get the same result? And, and to what extent? Sure. Yeah, yeah you, I would. So it, it, this part, there's no chaotic behavior or anything like oh, that. Oh, there is chaotic behavior, but uh, in other words, in other words, if you wanted to, it depends on what you're trying to predict. If you wanted to predict where, in this simulated space, a particular over density uh, would arise, then there's an extremely chaotic behavior that you would not be able to predict. But if if the character of the question you're asking is the statistical distribution of matter, then yes, uh, uh, you have a perfectly converged answer, regardless of what the initial phases of the, of the particles uh, that you set up the initial conditions are. At. Okay, so now let me describe how we can actually do inference with these simulations. So, right, so when we go to, when we go to compare simulations to observations, we don't, as I said, we, we can't predict either in the simulation, we, well, we can't predict in a simulation where a given overdensity will form, which is to also to say we can't predict where in the sky a given galaxy should be, but we can predict the, distribu the statistical distribution of galaxies, and we can, we can use simulations to predict the statistical distribution of matter. So, yeah, I mean, sorry, there's a question. Uh, when I think about uh, uh, Navier Stokes, there's an understanding that somehow, you know, small scales feel big scales, there's a cascade phenomenon. So, uh, here it seems, in some sense, way simpler. So, is, this, is there, you know, is there, because in this chaotic system of, of Navier Stokes, there's this, uh, you know, impossibility of separations of scale. It's the same here. Oh, it's a, so, you have That's a cascade right. mechanism, there's always a, yes, a way to understand. Uh, it's the same here, yes. Okay. So, for example, Given two, given two patches of, of, of universe which have different mean densities. For example, mm -hmm. in other words, here's some large scale mode of the. Uh, imagine, imagine taking the, a perfectly homogeneous, uh, just uh, you know, space time, and putting some large scale mode of over over dense here and under dense here. You get more um, uh, fluctuations that result in galaxies here than here. So you get more gravitational collapse in the over in the over dense region than the under dense region, and the more. Uh, just like in Navier-Stokes, the, 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 
the, the bigger separation between beats, the less coupling that there is, but all the same, there's coupling that can't be uh, ignored on any scale. So the cascade goes from uh, uh, um, infrared to UV, like the... the, the because there's well, two, two structure two. forming, so actually, uh, no. Or the so reverse. It, it's the reverse. Okay. So in, in, well, it's the reverse depending on uh, on cosmology. So in, in our cosmology, um, because because most of the universe is composed of, most of the gravitating matter is, is cold dark matter, <coughs> uh, cold dark matter forms hierarchically, such that small, uh, very small patches collapse first. The universe doesn't have to be that way. Well, I should be careful. Uh, I should be more careful with not <laughs> using language like a physicist. Um, but I can imagine universes which are not that way, but cold dark matter behaves in that way. So. Um, okay, so so one of the basic summary statistics of of, uh, of the distribution of matter in the universe is the power spectrum, the Fourier transform of the correlation function, the excess number of pairs of points. Uh, this is one of the basic things, um, one of the basic sort of predictables and observables of, uh, of a given cosmological model. So, so, what we can actually predict, for example, even in so in this in this highly simplified universe that only contains gravi gravity only forces and just cold dark matter, um, we can actually have a very high confidence prediction for the for the matter power spectrum. Um, but of course we can't directly observe that exactly because dark matter is dark and doesn't shine and gives us nothing that we can actually observe with a telescope. Okay, so how can we how can we then generate a prediction for something that we can then go out and observe and compare to something we see with a telescope? Right? With a telescope we can't observe the, the dark matter power power spectrum. Right? So 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 what do we do? How, how can we actually observationally test this, uh, these kinds of models? So one really nice way is through gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing is a generic feature referring to the deflection of uh, photons uh, propagating through a curved space-time uh, in general relativity. Uh, in particular, that uh, refers to the phenomenon wherein the, the images of galaxies that uh, propagate from, from the source to our telescopes, the images are distorted uh, along their way to our telescopes as a result of correlated deflections all along the line of sight to our telescopes. So there's a sort of artist schematic of of the, of the way that that, uh, that, that works uh, in, in general relativity with a background galaxy, which is just created essentially in this, in this way of probing cosmology, is essentially like a flashlight. You don't actually care so much about the background galaxy's physics itself. You're just using it as a way of shining on foreground mats. Okay? And so when you have one background galaxy behind a, a galaxy cluster and another one, another one, another one, because these galaxies have photons which travel through correlated patches of large-scale structure, then the distortions to their images will themselves be correlated. And so by measuring the, the correlation function of that distortion, you get a measure of the correlation function of the mass that's along the line of sight from those galaxies to our telescopes. So that's the basic physics behind, behind gravitational lensing that we're going to exploit in order to do inference with, uh, with simulations and uh, with, our, with our cosmological surveys. So the basic strategy then, in order to work out a prediction for how how I give you a, a set of cosmological parameters and now you give me what lensing signal I should see is okay, I'll give you your parameters you have some homogeneous distribution of particles whose positions you perturb to match the cosmic microwave background's power spectrum in a universe that has those parameters then you run your simulation forwards this extremely expensive simulation that, uh, that, that we step through with these finite time steps and then you uh, you essentially do this a Monte Carlo exercise where you trace uh, you trace rays through this simulation. So you trace the paths of would-be photons, uh, and then you work out what the the correlation function, the power spectrum of these of these deflected photons would be in such a universe. I have a question. Can't be stupid. Uh, if this cartoon you have on the screen in some way represents what you're doing, when the geodesic path gets to the edge of your box. You just send it back to the beginning so it can go through the next evolutionary stage, the next time step. So, in, so it, this is uh, so the method of solution here is actually use a periodic box. Yeah. So when you when you when you leave the box on one side, you actually wrap around and continue in the other. And then when you solve for the that, that's what you do with, with the ray tracing. That's also what you do when you solve for the force. Uh -huh. So the so you don't get the edge effects. Or exactly. Sort of, yeah. yeah. That's right. So great. So that's how we can work out what the lensing signal should be, and that actually is something that we can observe. So we can observe 
the, the images, the ellipticity uh, of galaxies actually, uh, in, a, in a telescope like the Dark Energy Survey or LSST. And then we measure the correlation function of their ellipticities. So that's actually the quantity that we then compare to the would-be correlation function of ellipticities in a simulation. Okay, so great. Um, before I talk about a, a pretty major problem with that program is that it's at least clear in principle how we work out predictions from a simulation we compared to observations. Okay, so, so yeah. Could you just ex explain how you get this, this image? So this is just... This is a toy, I'm sorry. But yeah, yeah, this, how does this relate to astronomical observations? So this is, a, uh, this is more, this is like a cartoon schematic. So I've actually just overlaid ellipses in cartoon fashion on top of this. Um, but what we actually observe with a, observationally are images of galaxies, and then we measure their quadrupole moment, which is to say we measure their ellipticity. Okay. Uh, and then we, uh, we literally just compute the statistical correlation of, of, the, of, the, of the, sh the shapes of those galaxies, of their, of their quadrupole. So again, unless there's some axis of evil, then galaxies' shapes should be completely randomly distributed in the sky. Right? So unless, unless galaxies know about where we are, then in the absence of any physics from the photons traveling to us, there should be no correlation in their orientations. Right? But by measuring the, cor the, correlate, the correlation in their orientations, then we are actually measuring the physics which is producing um, the distortions to their images. So that's what we actually then go out with the telescope and measure. Is we just take a bunch of, bunch of images, decompose them into uh, only their quadrupole moments, and then compute the correlation function of those quadrupoles. Thanks. Okay, so, so I, what I said was, was, was again, a, a misleading, a lie, uh, a, a certainly inaccurate, that we just, I tell you what the cosmology is, then you tell me what the correlation function of weak lensing is. But, but wait a minute, I mean, when you see, when you see um, posterior distributions and the likelihood of a given set of parameters, uh, this is a continuous distribution of, of the likelihood of a given uh, a given cosmology, but a cosmological simulation is an enormously expensive thing to run. So you can imagine what if, if you took what I said literally, then then you would say, okay, well I'm going to run a Bayesian inference NCMC exercise where uh, at each point in in my in my parameter exploration, I run an entire simulation and do this torturous calculation of tracing rays uh, and then computing correlation functions and then compute the likelihood of that point compared to observation, and then take another step. But each one of these simulations costs millions of CPU hours to run. So there, uh, there will be no way to make meaningful progress in this way, since even the most sloppy uh, MCMC for cosmology takes a million uh, likelihood evaluations in order to give a converged answer for what the posteriors are. So a million likelihood evaluations, each of which has a million CPU hours, is completely intractable. So what do we do? So um, we use machine learning techniques uh, uh, for this process. So in particular, we use a, uh, one of the earliest machine learning uh, techniques called uh, Gaussian process modeling, or Gaussian process emulation. So in, in GP, you'll, uh, you'll hear me say, because it becomes torturous to uh, say multiple syllables as many times as I'm going to say it in the next couple minutes. Uh, in GP emulation, uh, this is a generic technique for approximating some expensive function. So if you have some, some function like the likelihood of a given cosmology that you want to approximate, um, what you do is you evaluate that likelihood at a few discrete points, and then uh, you use GP emulation to interpolate between the points at which you've done the evaluation. So as I said, this is, uh, this is, this is one of the earliest machine learning uh, uh, techniques. Uh, the, the, Basic way to think about it, at least qualitatively, the way that it works, is that you have a map. So, uh, just like any smooth function uh, can be approximated to first order, uh, all smooth functions are linear to first order. So, all uh, all smooth functions are also Gaussians at second order about their about a given local max. Okay. So, qualitatively, you can you can leverage this uh, in a way that gives you not just a way to interpolate to get a smooth function from a set of discrete evaluations, but also in a way it gives you rigorously quantified errors on that interpolation. So that way you know exactly how finely you need to sample 
the behavior of your function across some smooth space in order to achieve a given error tolerance. So then programmatically the way that this works is you, you take, um, you have a desired level of accuracy that you want to achieve in how you're evaluating a given cosmological model. And then that determines how, how many simulations you need to then run. And then, and then hand over the task of, of getting a smooth evaluation of your cosmological parameter hand that task over to machine learning algorithms, in particular Gaussian process simulation. As a bit of a, of a, of a detail, so Gaussian process simulation actually only gives you a way to map um, from Rn to R, but the power spectrum is actually a full distribution, right? so this is the power spectrum that we're trying to emulate, is actually as a full, uh, it's not just the power spectrum at a given point, but actually the power spectrum across a full continuous range of scales. And so you have a dimensionality reduction problem that you need to um, that you need to solve. Rather than you don't want to you want to you don't want to emulate the, the value of the power spectrum at a single point. You want to capture it across a range of scales. And so there's a variety of ways you can do this. For example, principal component decomposition gives you a set of basis functions, or so does a, neural, a particular form of neural net called variational autoencoding, which again gives you a set of basis functions that you can then collapse your power spectrum onto. And then what you emulate is the coefficients of the of that of the, of the projection onto that basis. So that's, a, that's about as far as into the weeds that I want to go. But the, I think what I want to stress for purposes of this talk is just that machine learning algorithms are becoming used more and more in, uh, in ground level you know, theoretical cosmology. And when we turn things over to a machine, uh, a machine learning algorithm is when we reach a problem whose parameter values we do not care about anymore. Okay, so for example, what we, what we don't do is turn over to a neural net just the general prediction of a given cosmological observable, right? So we don't we don't have a 10 million parameter model which are just the weights on a given neuron that then give us an accurate description of the power spectrum. The reason is we're not just trying to create a replica of the universe. We really are trying to learn something about particular values that we care about in particular, like the amount of dark energy and how much it's evolving uh, as a function of time, if at all. Uh, and so I think, at least in my view, the real value in, in machine learning algorithms and contemporary science is when you reach some part of the problem whose, whose details you do not care about in the slightest bit. Like, for example, how do I interpolate from one simulation to another? The particular functional form and its values that give you that interpolation, at least to me, are entirely uninteresting. And so it's, for me, it's an acceptable uh, crutch just to rely on a machine learning algorithm to give me that interpolation as long as I'm still getting to learn something that I physically care about, like dark matter and dark energy. So, so with this interpolation, uh, how long do you, how long does it actually take if you want like acceptable errors, and what are those, what sizes of those errors? So depends on the size of the of the parameter space that you want to emulate. So, for example, in a, um, let me see. Let me also tell you how it scales. So, in the vanilla six parameter lambda CDM model that Planck just released constraints for. We have, at Argon, we run, I think it's um, 35 or 36 different cosmological parameters that you, or, uh, sorry, different simulations that we'll run. Um, and uh, so I should, I should also say it also depends on how much of that space you want to, to describe. So within reasonable ranges, as, set, uh, as Planck tells us, then it takes of you know of order uh, thirty to forty simulations for um, for for Planck cosmology, expanding to a parameter space which includes non-zero neutrino mass, so eight parameters. We uh, are just finishing running one hundred and eleven uh, samplings, so one hundred and eleven uh, simulations, um, each of which is you know of order millions of CPU hours. Right, and then you and then you do do the GP emulation on it. That's right. And That's what, right. what are the what are the sizes of the of the acceptable errors in the interpolation? Right. So they should be. So the, the guideline is order of magnitudes. So you want an order of magnitude higher precision than the observational errors on the quantity that you're emulating. So in this case, for example, for gravitational lensing, this will be measured to percent level precision. And so you want tenth of a percent level precision on your ability to predict that to say, okay. Well, I'm, I'm interpolating and I'm not, doing the, I'm not doing the perfect job that I'd like to do, but 
any error that's associated with, with imperfect machine learning training is tolerable and that it's not going to impact my inference. So that's the rough order, the rough way we can get an estimate. So thank you. Okay. Okay. I think I'm going to cover that. Okay. So here's an example outcome. So this is uh, these are cosmological parameter constraints uh, published in a recent dark energy survey paper using um, emulated uh, power spectra. Um, this is the year one data release from the Dark Energy Survey, shown in blue. These are the, these are the, the likelihood contours. In this, in this case, this is the space of power spectrum normalization and omega matter, so the fraction of the, fraction of the universe's energy contents that are bound up in, 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 in gravitating mass. And in green are the Planck constraints on this quantity, and the joint uh, posteriors are shown in red. So this is a... A recent example of this program that I just described of this combination of simulated inference with machine learning algorithms to learn about the universe's energy contents. Can you explain this, this rather drastic uh, No one can, actually. So, well, it, so it depends on it depends on, on what you mean by drastic. Uh, you are you are correct to be worried that there is a disagreement. Uh, so, uh, so what Aaron is pointing out is that you have these green contours. They ain't overlapping like we want them to with those blue contours. Many surveys have tried to do this with gravitational lensing and with, with, with matter clustering, and they, they arrive at the same result. So in other words, if you try, and this, I should say that's also true regardless of whether or not you use Gaussian process emulation or more elementary uh, analytical techniques uh, to approximate the power spectrum. Um, so. It seems to be a feature that we're, this tension in the inference that comes from comparing cosmic microwave background based inference to large scale structure based inference. But is the, is the guess that there's some physics going on in the LSS evolution equations that we're missing? So that's the hope, actually. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like, cosmology does not want to be faced with the same nightmare scenario yeah. that particle physics is faced yeah. with today. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, so where do you think the new physics is then? Well, I mean, uh, Failure of general relativity to describe gravity on cosmological scales is one plausible uh, outcome. Um, yeah, observational the, systematics on the measurements of, of lensing is another one, and that's you know always the uh, that's always this, the safe bet when when the discussion of whether or not GR is a, is applicable as a classical theory of gravity. So, so but can you repeat please what the blue is? I there. Yeah. So the so either the blue or the red or the green are the confidence intervals on, in, in, these, in this space of these two particular cosmological parameters, which is omega matter and then the normalization of the, of the, of the, of the power spectrum. Uh, so the blue are the, are the confidence intervals that you obtain when you follow this program that I described earlier, large scale structure base inference. And the green are the same, the, 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 the posteriors on the same parameters as inferred by Planck, but instead of using large-scale structure, they're using the cosmic microwave background. So uh, Aaron is correctly concerned that they don't overlap. Uh, the extent to which they they don't overlap is it's a two or three or four sigma tension, depending on how you count. So it's definitely enough. It's enough of a tension to be interesting. Uh, it may it may go away as analyses. <coughs> Yes. So, so, the, so the size of these ellipses is a quantification includes a quantification of that uncertainty. Oh, it is in there. That 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 the error, the contribution to the error budget from uncertain lensing measurements is included in these contours. So, so when you forward propagate the errors on, on lensing all the way through the cosmological so inference. The additional concern is that that error is actually larger than what we uh, Not just that the error is larger in a statistical sense, but that we're systematically wrong. Right? So, 
So in other words, there could be, in our, in our prediction machinery, there could be a source of systematic bias. Right? So I think that, that's really now, I think, the major concern of, of cosmologists. Uh, so we're now in a regime where our statistical constraints are just really tight. Like these surveys have millions of galaxies with just exquisitely precise measurements. And so our ability to accurately model uh, is really the dominant source of uncertainty in our, in our ability to infer things about cosmology. And one of the reasons why uh, I've, I'm giving this talk is because um, the, just the core feature that we, that we exploit in order to be able to do inference is simulation-based uh, inference, which comes with an uncertainty in our ability to predict, which we have a very difficult time rigorously quantifying, because we have no known answer to the fundamental equations of motion that we can validate our, our methods against. So you mentioned that it could be that the GR is wrong, um, but you were using a Newtonian version, right? I mean, we think about GR background, so uh, in what way GR could be wrong? I see. Um, so, for, so one way you can check that is by uh, numerically solving uh, simulations of structure formation in a way that captures relativistic effects, and then computing the power spectrum under that approximation versus under the, the decoupled uh, Blasa Poisson system, and, and then seeing whether or not the power spectrum differences are significant. And to the best of our knowledge now, that source of error is negligible compared to this difference. Oh. And if you, if you assume uh, another other cosmological model uh, not the big model of the natural class book. Uh, I know if people try to work with this innovation of the non-genius cosmology. Mm -hmm. I know if that's a uh, so, so there are there are a very limited class of simulations that can be run um, that that are that, where GR is not the, the is not the assumed model. Uh, like for example, um, so, uh, a, a jargon term for this is F of R models of, of gravity, where essentially the, the uh, Ricci tensor enters in a different way into the action. Uh, and so, it's um, in. Uh, Theoretically, there's no reason why such models can't be explored. In practice, they're extraordinarily more expensive. You have additional terms that you need to compute at each time step, uh, uh, besides just solving the Poisson equation. And so it becomes prohibitively expensive very, very rapidly. Uh, it's, not, it's not just a, uh, a fact of confirmation bias. It's not just that we only want to explore general relativistic cosmologies. It's that methods of solution are, at least at present, nearly prohibited for very interesting classes of, of modification to differ. So, um, I have a number of other different applications of, uh, of simulation-based inference that I, I could talk about. Uh, it's also the end of the day, uh, so I'm wondering whether I should actually start an entirely new uh, program to study structure growth rather than maybe have a few more questions and then and then wrap up and have some wine. Maybe I could take the temperature in the room before I do that. <laughs> I mean, if, we've got another 15 minutes. I mean, if you want to, could you do something in like five, 10 minutes? Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, great. <coughs> so, I've been describing a way which we can do cosmological inference with, um, with numerical simulations in a way that's basically impossible otherwise. Uh, so that's one, that's I think one, one uh, nice outcome of, of, of using simulations and trying to gain knowledge about, about the real world um, that we can actually compare to observations by using simulations. And now I just want to give maybe just one example of a way in which there is actually no necessary uh, observational referent. Uh, so a way we can actually just use simulations to just understand uh, general relativity and particularly lambda CDM cosmology using simulations that would also be impossible otherwise. So uh, this is this is an understanding the, the structure of dark matter halos. Okay, so I haven't I haven't used this word yet. This is a uh, this is a jargon term, a dark matter halo. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, just refers to a gravitationally self-bound collection of of dark matter. Okay, so you have some 
homogeneous bath and it has some overdensities and it undergoes gravitational collapse under its own weight. Uh, and the end result of that, of that collapse is a dark matter halo. Okay, so you can think of it as the universe is initially expanding and then you have some overdensity which begins to collapse and essentially decouples from, from the expansion of the universe and becomes a gravitationally self-bound system unto itself. Okay? So when you look at simulations, even with your eye, the eye is an excellent halo finder. So if you look at just the density field and a visualization of, of the universe, uh, it's very actually easy to pick out these, these dense knots uh, that, that are dark matter halos. Okay? Um, so to an excellent approximation of the dynamics, once you are in a dark matter halo, you essentially feel no gravitational forces from anything else other than the bulk motion of the halo that you're in. Okay, so you can actually very well approximate the motion of galaxies and stars within a halo, um, ignoring, all, ignoring all else. So it's a very useful approximation for this highly nonlinear system, that it's a distribution of mass according to some power spectrum, and then dark matter halos that are collapsed within that distribution. So the reason why it's useful in terms of making predictions is that um, galaxies live in dark matter halos. So uh, I think I'll... I will disregard the difference between subhalos and host halos and satellite galaxies and central galaxies for the, for the purposes of the remaining time, and, and just say that in any lemma-CDM simulation of the universe, what we observe is that the deepest pits in the gravitational potential are at the centers of these dark matter halos, and so these are just the natural sites for galaxy formation, for, for gas to collapse into and, and to form stars. So this is an observational motivation for studying dark matter halos, but I really just want to talk about something that's of purely theoretical interest, which is the universality of their internal structure. So, on the one hand, if I have a, if I have a, a perfectly symmetric system, and I have a spherical, spherically overdense region, then with basic pencil and paper methods, I can do some reasonable approximations for what the density profile of that dark matter halo should be. But again, there's no symmetries in sight in this problem. Uh, and so it's not at all clear um, in a real simulation which involves many, many mergers of these, of these dark matter halos what their internal structure should be. Uh, it's, it's certainly far from clear how I would calculate that with a pencil, what mergers do to, to the structure of dark matter halos. Uh, and yet every simulated dark matter halo has a essentially universal functional form for the distribution of its mass profile, um, which uh, was first discovered by uh, Navarro, Frank, and White in 1996. This is the NFW profile. Uh, so it's, um, I use the word discovered and I'm, I'm being sloppy with it, but I actually don't know what else to, what other, you, what other word to use in this context because uh, no one knows how to predict the distribution of mass uh, in, inside a collapsed dark matter halo in the presence of, of the complexity that we have to work with. And so what NFW did was essentially just treated a simulation as if it were a data set. And they mined that data set and they just asked questions of that data set like, here's a halo, what profile do you have? And here's a halo, what profile do you have? And every single halo in statistical reasonable uh, uh, fluctuations obeys essentially a R cubed fall off at, at high radius and a 1 over R uh, fall off at low, uh, in, the internal, uh, in the internal regions. Yeah. Here's Go ahead, Norm. So yeah, just what are the parameters there? Rho zero, R of zero, and C. Um, so what are the... Great, yes. So, so what are the scale in the So region? this equation is the density profile as a function of little r, which is the yeah. which is the halocentric distance. So this is the distance from the center of mass. Mm -hmm. uh, big R, R of year, is the rough boundary of the halo. And okay. C is, is a... Is it to the total mass in some way? Or? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, once you have that, you can the compute it. Yeah, of course. It's the yeah, so okay. it's, it's the Viria radius. So okay. it's roughly the region which, which describes what uh, inside of which is collapsed okay. and beyond okay. which is not. And C? And C is just the concentration parameter. So this just describes how, how concentrated the, the mass in that halo is. So C is essentially the free parameter in this profile. And has a very restricted range that is a yeah. itself a function of mass. How does it compare to the mount? Yeah, no, uh, because um, there's, the, there's the other, you know, Mond version. Well, uh, like Mond, uh, Mond gives a way of describing the orbits inside uh, in, inside a potential, and either either um, either either Mond uh, or 
or GR uh, is uh, does result in NFW-like profiles. Mm -hmm. um, in observed galaxies, we actually have, we actually see that the internal regions are internal profiles are core as opposed to having the, the straight one over R profile, and so MOND provides one way of understanding that. Um, that but it's the same thing. It's, just it's the same thing. Different time. That's right. I'm trying to understand the, the effect of the baryonic physics. So how does yeah. this radial density profile for a, a cold dark matter halo uh, compare to if I took some baryons and tried to do the same thing? Great. So that's also a useful question in the context of MON. Uh, because, so as I said, this is a, this is a gravity only. Only dark matter particles are in, this, are in this simulation. And so this is universal in the context of lambda CDM. But the real universe has, has gas. Uh, and stars form, and uh, AGN blow gas around, and then that can impact the profile of, of the dark matter just through mutual gravitational interaction between gas and, and dark matter, which is not captured in a simulation <laughs> that doesn't have that effect. And so it, that makes it very difficult to actually go to, op go to observed halos, measure their profiles, and then, uh, and then infer whether or not MOND or, or lambda CDM describes their... Yeah, yeah, I wasn't actually asking such a complicated question. Okay. I was, no, no, it's very useful. I, I was more curious if you turn on collisions and have some pressure, so you're getting some of the baryonic physics, but not all of it. Right. Does the radial density profile look similar to this? Presumably not. It yeah, does. It looks oh, similar to this, but okay. the, the physics that you turn on, uh, the, the, the correct answer to your question depends sensibly on the physics that you turn on. So, this, uh, so uh, quick answer, not going into too much detail, but if you turn on, for example, radiative cooling, Dark matter does not shine; cannot radiatively cool. Uh, so, if you have a if you have a universe in which you have radiated cooling, then you will find that the gas is more centrally concentrated relative to the dark matter. That has a back reaction that pulls the dark matter in and enhances the profile. If you have supernovae feedback, which we know happen in the real universe, and push gas out, then that will wash out a central density and create a core profile. So, there's no generic answer for how the internal structure of a halo should respond in the presence of a baryons. It depends on which of these mechanisms are dominant. And that itself will be a function of halo mass. And presumably cosmic time, too. And itself will be a function of cosmic time, since, for example, in the case of supernovae, supernovae rates are, are time-dependent. So, so the detailed answer as to whether or not this, uh, this is the correct model for halo structures uh, is that it's unknown. It's, it's subject of active work. So, so it was posited, so, so that, that this is one way in which you can create, you can create a, uh, a run a simulation and essentially treat it like a data set, uh, and then try and discover what the predictions are of the model. Even though you know what the model is going in, you don't know what the predictions are. Uh, so it was posited at the time of this, of this uh, famous paper that the NFW profile was, a, was an attractor solution for essentially uh, mergers, the production of dark matter halos through mergers. The evidence for this was, you know, heuristic, but uh, certainly reasonable. Um, and at the time, the best simulations that they had uh, available were not able to determine, and so it was just a, it was positive this was an attractor solution. It was a way of explaining this trend that was mined from a simulated data set. Um, about ten years later, this inter this interpretation of the of the data set mining was rebutted with a merger simulation. Oh, thought I had a. I do, yeah, okay. So with a merger simulation. So what, what was done in uh, this paper by Kazantidis, uh, actually this, uh, this was a postdoc at UChicago at the time, uh, in the mid-2000s, was uh, he ran a sequence of, of very high resolution focused uh, simulations of mergers and looked at what happens essentially when you just smash two halos together. So this is another example of a system for which there is no known analytical solution and there probably will not be. And so uh, let me sloppily use a word that I've just spent an interesting hour and a half with the discussion section uh, talking about how I shouldn't. So they ran an experiment about <laughs> what happens when you smash two halos together. And they just asked the simulation to tell the answer. Okay? So the interesting result was that if you have a high concentration halo and a high concentration halo, when you merge them together, they form a high concentration halo. And the same is true with low concentration halos. And when you have halos of different concentrations, and different, uh, different internal uh, profiles, then the result is, it's like an average between the two. It, it happens to be an average which favors the higher concentration halo with the steeper profile. Uh, uh, that's a bit of a detail for this purpose. What it shows is that 
there is there is no there is no sense in which you start off with some profile and then you start with a completely different profile and you end up with no matter how you start it with an NFW, right? So you have some kind of mass weighted average of the profiles that you start with. So this more or less alone tells you you do not have a, some generic attractor solution. <laughs> I got excited. So you don't have uh, any sense in which you have a, a sort of a generic attractor solution um, that you can use to, to appeal to in order to predict why there should be this NFW halo as this universal, uh, this universal structure of the NFW halo. This is a fact that we learned from mining simulations and treating them as if they were data sets. Uh, it actually remains an open problem to understand in detail why the NFW profile is, is universal. Um, but it's a fact that we learn about a purely a, a sort of model only um, fact of, uh, of Lambda CVM that we essentially only know from simulations. So, before I give, I think I won't go into the litany of other examples of sort of different characteristics of knowledge that we get from simulations, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll just end up with that. I wish I had an intelligent answer for you. Uh, I, I, I don't have one. Has anyone else, has anyone else studied uh, entropy under uh, interaction, under gravitational interactions that can comment more intelligently than my non answer? Maybe numerically you could throw the H function of Boltzmann. You know, you see, I mean, we require for him the two point function, you know, the two point function distribution. Maybe function, it's, not, it's not really. The H function clearly, or minus the H function clearly, um, decreases. But the question is whether the gravitational interaction is ergodic. Because if that's, the case, if that's not the case, then the Boltzmannian argument does, doesn't apply at all. So you would not be surprised that the entropy um, decreases. Mm -hmm. I would like to punt. Entropy decreases in the real Um, so I just wanted to say something about like how um, so it seems like the, the sort of um, the, the the prediction that we end up actually um, verifying is um, like a very a very small part of um, what, what would be involved in like a, a whole universe simulation. Um, can you say something about how, how that even relates to questions about whether the um, the uh, with the dark um, energy profile is changing over time. I mean, is 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 that just fine to say? Well, we're going to take this box and impose like periodic boundary conditions. Are, are there additional worries that come in? There are. So uh, you have to, for example, um, because because Lambda CDM, for example, predicts power on all scales. Then you need to make sure, right? So uh, so. When you have some, some large scale mode, you have more collapse in the large scale mode than the other dense mode, right? So, for example, you need to make sure that your inference is not impacted by just random variations in how you set the box. Right? So, unfortunately, this means, I mean, 
It's kind, of a, it's kind of a dumb answer, but it means you need a very large box. Uh, now, fortunately, that actually can be reasonably rigorously quantified, um, both analytically. Uh, you can analytically calculate what the expected fluctuations are, the size of the typical fluctuation, the, the amplitude of the typical fluctuations on a given scale. And so you need to make sure that that amplitude is small relative to the precision of the power spectrum that you're trying to predict. So it's, that's actually one of the main reasons why it's so expensive to make accurate predictions using this numerical method is because you need really, really large boxes, but you need to be able to resolve galaxies. So you need a huge dynamic range. Um, and presumably, if, if the, the initial conditions you were putting in weren't pretty close to homogeneous, it would just be hopeless. That's right. That's right. If you had lots of power on large scales, uh, it, it would, yeah, it would be hopeless. Already, we're at the edge of hopeless. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, um, could you say something about what what you hope to do with the um, with the the new telescope? Like, how will that improve the um, the sort of data that you're, you're getting through your simulation? Can I show you something that I've done? Uh, cool. So, I, like I said, I just got back from a um, a meeting from that from analysis team meeting um, in which we've use these simulations in order to create a, a fully synthetic universe. So rather than just trying to simulate power spectra, what we've done is we've, we've ran a, an enormous uh, simulation that vastly swamps the size of these, these large amplitude fluctuations, uh, but also resolves low mass galaxies. And we have modeled how galaxies occupy the halos in this simulation, and we've created the following image. So this is a synthetic image, and we've, so this has been one of my main pieces of research over the past years, basically been creating the universe that went into this, this image. And what's the ambitious program that we're now gonna do with the LSST collaboration is to, um, we're now using this, this, this universe as a truth catalog, and we're gonna have this full stop, end-to-end -end forward modeling of the universe that the LSST telescope and camera and, and atmospheric variations and motions of the electrons on the register of behind the camera um, and data processing in the back end that would observe if this were the real universe. So uh, this is so this particular forward modeling program is the most ambitious end-to-end uh, -end simulation that has that has been done for optical telescopes to date. It's still in process. It's of order 100 million CPU hours just to be able to do just the image simulation let alone the simulations that went, that went into it. Uh, and so it's been really, it's been, actually it's been super fun because it's been a way to get like hundreds of scientists uh, to actually work on common problems together. It's actually a really hard thing to do sociologically. Uh, and the way, to, the, the way that we've done it is by just creating a, a, a fully synthetic universe and said, okay, here is the, the real answer that we would like you to try and recover. Run whatever analysis that you like uh, and see if you can recover the correct underlying cosmology. Uh, so in this version, we actually distributed the, uh, everyone in the collaboration knows what the cosmology is. In the next version, we'll do this blind. And we'll actually have several of these that we done blind. Um, so, yeah, is here. this image a single frame, or are you doing the whole southern sky? This, uh, this is a single f um, few square degree patch. I think maybe this is like 20 square degrees. And we'll do 5,000 square degrees for this, for this simulation. Um, the actual image simulation will be more like a few hundred square degrees, but the truth catalog is, is, a, is a 5,000 square degree wedge. Uh, so I'm extremely interested to see um, how far we can push um, inference towards, uh, towards small scales. So in other words, the more nonlinear you are, the more complicated your galaxy model needs to be in order to actually describe the variations that we see in the universe. Uh, uh, LSST will have... Um, incredibly precise measurements down to very, very small scales that are extremely difficult to predict to high accuracy just because the nonlinearities become so extreme. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is just seeing how far down the scale, how far down the small scales, uh, we can actually push inference by using this sort of simulation-based program. So that's one of the things that I'm really, really excited about for LSST and for sort of simulations. I have another question, but I think I want to I think maybe we should wrap it up. Right. I mean, like, sure. <laughs> yeah, we can continue. Okay. We won't let you go away. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks.